I've read every single Amazon shareholder letter going back 20 years, and I noticed one repeated theme throughout all of them. It was from Jeff Bezos himself. The supreme output metric of a company. The supreme output metric is free cash flow per share. Jeff Bezos focused on free cash flow per share because he said out of everything you can look at from a company, that tells you more about the company, its strengths, its positioning, and its growth than any other metric the free cash flow per share. Now, if you're not familiar with what the free cash flow per share is, the formula is very simple. You take the free cash flow of the company and you divide it by the share count. That's it. But getting this information can be kind of tricky. It's not really available on all the different websites. So what I did was I added this chart into Qualtrum. We can go onto any company, and I'll show you an example right here on Microsoft. We can look at the cash flow of the company, but now we can also look at the free cash flow per share of the company. And some of these companies, it looks similar. Some of them, it looks very different. So in this episode, what we're gonna be doing is using that metric, the free cash flow per share, and looking at how it looks on every single one of the companies I'm invested in. All nine of my world-class tech holdings. I'm gonna look at the progress of the cash flows that these companies produce. So we have a lot of fun to get into. We're gonna be doing an entire portfolio update. I'll be giving you a performance update as well. We'll be looking at some news articles, but we're gonna be focusing today mostly on the fundamentals of the company. Now let's go ahead and just start off by a quick portfolio update. Uh, we're transparent here, that's how we do things, good or bad. Whether we're in the green or in the red, I show you what's going on. This portfolio has bounced from being $20,000 $20, in the green to now $35,000 in the red. And it looks really bad, I know. I'm down $35,000. The good news is that I invested $129,000. I'm down to $93,000, which means I'm down 27% which is not great. I'm not trying to say this is a, you know, this is a good thing being down 27%. Optimally, I'd like to be in the green, right? But being down 27% when I started this portfolio in 2021 is not terrible. This is not devastation. I can recover from these losses. The market overall is down around this much. The S&P 500 a bit less and the QQQ a bit more. So overall, I'm not happy with this performance. I want it to do better but I can recover from this. A lot of these tech companies have been sold off, I think overly sold off, and I think they will recover over time. Now, another thing that I do that a lot of other YouTubers and content creators I don't see doing, I'd love to see them doing this more often, is I benchmark my performance against the S&P 500. This is what it looks like since the beginning of the portfolio. The story fund is in blue, the S&P 500 is in red. So right now I'm getting beat by the S&P 500. It simply held up better this year, because again, right now, the market is going into consumer staples, to oil companies. I have none of those in my portfolio. I have companies that I consider to be very defensive, Amazon and Apple. I think they're like tech consumer staples, but they're not trading that way. The market has raced out of these tech companies, even big tech, into these defensive companies. And so the S&P 500 is only down 3.21%. The story fund is down 26%. So it looks like there's a wide gap there. But I've been able to close this type of gap before. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, the story fund went up like 12% in just a week. So things can change pretty rapidly. If we have some good macroeconomic news, if inflation does come down by some chance, it starts to come down. If the Fed says that they don't have to rise interest rates as much as, as they want to, then this type of thing could improve. This portfolio could change rapidly. So as of right now, I can't control the macro events. I can't control inflation and all of that stuff. What I can do is control the decisions I make with my investments. And I'm choosing to be very patient with my holdings. I invested in these companies, wanting to own them for the next five to 10 years. That's what I said when I originally invested in them. And I intend to do that. And that's a long time. So I'm gonna give these companies time to go through this market cycle, time to build their cash flows, time to secure their businesses. I'm not going to be impatient with them and get concerned the first time the market goes down. Now, having said that, let's go ahead and go through every one of these companies, 
top to bottom, and we'll look at the free cash flow per share and see how these companies are doing. Now, the website that we're gonna be using to do this is one that I developed for the Patreon. You can gain access to this website by simply joining the Patreon, it's 10 bucks a month. There's a free trial, so if you join now, you can actually use it for almost the entire month uh, before you get your first charge. And then it's just cancel anytime, month to month. So there's no commitments, there's no risk or anything like that, no upsells. And this software does come with a lot of features. You have the dip finder, a watch list that tells you moving averages of your company, you have a dividend tracker, and you have Qualtrum Insights, which is this tool to give us all this information about these companies. So try out the Patreon. I think you'll really enjoy it. We have thousands of members on it every single day. They love it, and we're constantly building new features. But let's go ahead and take a look at Amazon here. Now, I said at the beginning of this that Jeff Bezos said, the supreme metric, the supreme output metric above all others for a company is free cash flow per share. And it makes sense. You are buying the free cash flow of a company when you buy the share. You're not buying the employees or the executive team or the different products that they produce. That's part of it. But at the end of the day, what you're really paying for is cash flow. Stocks are worth their future discounted cash flows. So when you're buying a share of a company, you're buying the free cash flow that the company produces divided by that share count that you purchased therefore making the free cash flow per share the most simple and powerful metric to track. So what Jeff Bezos said here does make a lot of sense. If a company can grow its free cash flow on a per share basis, that means that it's growing the amount of cash flow it produces based on every share you purchase year over year. And that's something that we wanna see. Now, having said that, ironically, when we look at Amazon, Amazon is one of the rare companies that if we look at the free cash flow per share here, it's one of the rare companies where it's going in the wrong direction. Their free cash flow per share was negative in 2021. Not only was it not growing, it literally got thrown into the negative. So I'm looking at this as an investor and trying to assess what this means for the future of the company. The whole goal here is to buy free cash flow on a per share basis. That's what I'm wanting to do. Here I have my biggest holding, the one that I have the most money in, in my portfolio, and it's going in the wrong direction. Now, normally this would be concerning, but this is Amazon we're talking about here. This company is notorious for using its cash flows to aggressively throw that money back into reinvestments. And that is exactly what they're doing here. This isn't that they're not profitable or they don't generate a lot of cash flows. This is simply that all their cash flows are being redirected Instead of just to the bottom line, instead of to profits, they take that cash flow and they say, what can we buy with it? What can we reinvest that will give our shareholders an attractive return? Another thing we can do on Qualtrim is look at the expenses here and we can filter by the different expenses. CapEx here is in blue. If you're not familiar with CapEx, capital expenditures are like some of the hard goods that companies spend their money on. Warehouses, trucks, headsets, boots, vests, different things that the company has to buy to expand their business. Amazon is a CapEx heavy business. They buy a lot of warehouses. They buy a lot of land, a lot of property, a lot of, a lot of uh, vans, right? They have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of vans driving around every day. So they spend a lot of CapEx. And what Amazon did was in 2021, instead of having their free cash flow go into the positive and just having it be another year, since they're getting all this excess demand because of COVID, they decided to say, hey, let's go ahead and double our delivery network double all the warehouses, all the trucks, all the employees. We're literally gonna hire hundreds of thousands of employees in one year. We're gonna open up hundreds of new warehouses across the US and across the world. And they spent a fortune in CapEx, $61 billion in one year, 61 billion. So this is an investment that hopefully gives us a return later on. That is the goal of it. If this spending doesn't give us a return, then it's not worth it. And Amazon made a mistake. But they're making these investments because they believe if you get your items quicker, if you have better customer service, you'll continue to use Amazon above all other competition. That's an assumption that I agree with. So I consider this to be a good investment. I think that I will get a return with Amazon doing this with their cash flow. Now, this huge amount of spending makes it so that their free cash flow per share is in the negative. But the investment thesis here is that over time, this will start to go back down. Every year, their free, their CapEx, sorry, will go back down like it went up to 2021. It'll incrementally go down. And as it goes down, the free cash flow will start to go back up. 
That is the idea here. That Amazon is going to be spending less on expanding and growth. They already went through this massive investment cycle. And now they're going to see the return on that. So we're going to see the return in the form of having free cash flow per share. So this is a little bit more complex of a story. Most companies are very simple. You just see their free cash flow per share grow every single year. But Amazon likes to do this thing that spooks investors where they really just throw a ton of money into investments. They try to get a good return on them. Uh, and they're willing to do that more than any other company, including big tech. But I'm investing in this company primarily. The biggest reason I invest in it is because I believe firmly. I really believe this. I don't know for sure, but this is my thoughts on it. I think this company will generate incredible amounts of free cash flow per share in the future. If we look at this, they're generating $25 billion in 2020 of free cash flow. I, I think that they can double this, triple it in the next five years. I really do. Now, I'm not saying that's a guarantee. I could be wrong, but that's the reason that I'm buying the company. They have Amazon has so many advantages. They have AWS, which is by far the biggest leader. It has an enormous moat, high switching costs. The contracts are very long with the customers they have. So Amazon Web Services is a huge profit center for the company. And then their retail business is unparalleled. There's nothing like it in the world, nothing in existence. In one year, they built out more warehouse space than the entire size of Walmart in one incremental year. So this company right now that seems like an unprofitable company, I think will prove to be very profitable in the coming years. That's the bet that I'm making. So like Jeffrey Bezos says, the free cash flow per share is the supreme output metric of the company. I truly believe that to be the case. And the same thing with Amazon. I think over time, they will generate a growing amount of free cash flow per share. Now, one company in my portfolio that's already doing this like crazy is Google. Let's go ahead and check this one out. G-O-O-G -O -O -G is a ticker symbol. We have Google trading at a reasonable valuation here, a 19 Ford PE. In my opinion, uh, this is cheap. Google is a cheap company. The S&P 500 is selling for a 17. Google sells for a 19. So you pay slightly more, right? 10, 12% more for Google than the S&P 500. That is a very cheap price to pay for a company with this type of fundamentals. It is a high quality company. Growing revenue, EBITDA, free cash flow, net income, growing earnings per share. The cash is also growing. They have no debt, really no debt to speak of, and they're doing share buybacks. It's just everything in the company is going in the right direction, and the valuation is very reasonable. Now, if we look at, again, the key metric here, the free cash flow per share is growing faster than the free cash flow. Because when you divide their free cash flow by the shares outstanding, it's even faster growth because they're doing buybacks. There's less shares outstanding to divide the free cash flow by every single year. So their free cash flow per share has gone from in 2014, $16.80, $23, to $100.66 in 2021. A hundred bucks per share per year in 2021. And this is expected to go up even after this incredibly groundbreaking year from Google, where they went from $62 to 100, this is expected to continue to go up. This company's trading at $2,300 a share. So at $100 of free cash flow per share, that's a 23 times free cash flow per share multiple. It's very cheap for a company like Google. Across the board, I think Google has a very wide moat, consistent growth, has a lot of opportunity to grow income in the future. This company does have a little risk with the recession, with ad spend going down, like most other companies, but I think it's undervalued. It has a wide moat. I'm very bullish on this company. I really think I'm gonna make more money on Google in the upcoming five years. So we'll see how this plays out, but right now I'm not doing much with it. I'm just holding on to it, letting this company grow. Next up, we have Microsoft, another company that across the board, the metrics look very solid for this company. The biggest argument I get against Microsoft, the biggest thing people say is, yeah, the company's great, but the valuation, that's the biggest concern. And that's a fair concern. Microsoft always trades at a bit of a premium because this is a very high quality company. It trades at a 24 PE ratio, so above the S&P 500. And that makes sense. They have very consistent revenue growth. You don't see charts like this too often growing this quickly. They have consistent EBITDA growth. So Microsoft, no matter what, they seem to keep their gross margins around that 70 to 80%. Look at these gross margins. This is from 65% at the low and 95% at the high. They maintain those high margins no matter how much money they're making. That is a huge focus for Microsoft. Now, 
Looking at, again, the free cash flow per share, the most important metric, it's great. There's nothing to complain about with Microsoft. Since 2016, it was a little bit flat from 2012 to 2016. But from 2016, it's gone from $3 per share to 2021 being $7.44. So they've been doubling it over the years, growing at 20% per year. That is very fast growth from a high quality company. It trades at an elevated valuation. So Microsoft is more expensive optically. But let me just put it this way. A lot of people saying that Microsoft is an expensive company and they have this other company that's much cheaper, Microsoft will outlive it. Microsoft will be around for another 100 years. It'll be around longer than I am and longer than you are watching this video. A lot of the companies you're comparing to Microsoft in terms of valuation, this company is going to outlive it. So if you keep that in mind, a company you're going to invest in for the next 50 years, Microsoft is going to be around. That is my prediction. And I think that deserves a little bit of a premium. Now, the next company after Microsoft is possibly the most divisive one. It's one that I made the biggest mistake on with my assumptions. I got this one wrong. There's no other way to put it. I got Netflix wrong. I took the L on this one, even though I'm still holding on to the stock. But let's go ahead and look at what happened. I invested a lot of money into Netflix on the assumption that they would continue to grow with little resistance for at least another few years, that they would continue to tack on another 10 to 15 million subscribers year after year after year, like they've done for so many years. And they hit resistance far sooner than I expected. Right away, they hit resistance and their subscriber count started to go into the negative. It was horrible. It was a, you know, a horrible event for Netflix, for any investors in it. Um, some people saw this coming. I was warned by some people and they were right on this. I should have listened. But I just assumed that the total addressable market was bigger than it actually was. So a lot of people got hurt on Facebook. Some people took their hits on PayPal. I got hit on Netflix. This is one that, you know, it's not a fun one for me. So I'm down $18,000 on this holding. I still have $9,500 in value, which I'm down currently, if we go to the holdings tab here, I'm down currently around 65%. So pretty bad. Not a good situation. It could come back over time, but not likely as of right now. Now, the normal thing to do when a stock like this falls this much is to become depressed, think you made a mistake, and sell out of the company. That's what most people do. But I try to take an objective, non-emotional look at this and now determine whether or not the company right now, with its current price, is trading at a reasonable valuation. Even though Netflix has a lot of challenges it's facing, they're expected to lose a lot more subscribers this quarter, and it's probably going to come in lower than expected. I think they're going to lose two to three million subscribers next quarter. It's going to be very ugly. The reason that I'm sticking into this stock is because it's trading at a 16.6 PE ratio. This used to trade at a 40 or 50, and the multiples have come down to not only not be a highly valued company, now it's below the market average, 16.6. The S&P 500 is, is 17. So Netflix is trading at a discount to SPY, not something that we've ever seen before. And when I look at it, yeah, Netflix has problems. People go on about the bad content. They make mistakes like uh, Stranger Things. I thought they should have released it week by week. It was a big mistake releasing it all at once, in my opinion. So they have some things that they can improve on, the quality of their content, their release schedule, opening up a new ad-supported tier. There's lots of room for improvement but I want to give this one time. I think Netflix will be around for the next 20 years. This company's not going anywhere and the management is founder led. They are extremely dedicated at repairing their reputation, repairing this company and getting this stock back up to where it was, growing into a global streaming service. That is their goal. So I want to just stay a shareholder. I want to keep invested in this company. The PE ratio is low. The revenue growth still looks good. The EBITDA growth looks good. Of course, Netflix has always had their free cash flow, which is the big question for shareholders. The free cash flow doesn't look good over time. This is a company that spent more and more on content every single year, investing heavily knowing that these other big streaming services were going to pull their content. NBC took off all their content for Peacock. Disney took it all off for Disney+. Plus. Now Netflix is on their own. So in my opinion, all this spending, all this negative cash flow that they're spending on content was very necessary. They had to do this to grow their original content library. There are some signs of things turning to the positive. In 2020, Netflix had their first really free cash flow positive year. That was because they lowered their content spend because of 
production issues in 2020. But even in 2021, it wasn't so bad. Minus 0.03. So 300 million negative free cash flow. And then this year, 2022, is supposed to be positive. So Netflix from here on out is supposed to be self-funded, no longer reliant on debt, no longer reliant on issuing more shares. A free cash flow positive company from here on out. That's a tough challenge. We'll see if they can do that. But as of right now, this is the most risky company in my portfolio, in my opinion, in terms of the outcome of it, the volatility. Netflix is extremely volatile. It has always been. So I don't recommend investing in this company unless you like a lot of uh, uh, excitement in your life, in your financial life. If you want excitement in that, then invest in Netflix. Um, but otherwise, you know, this isn't one that I'd recommend to other people because this company has a lot going on with it. Um, having said that, again, I'm going to stay invested in it. I want to see what happens over the next five years. I think this company could, uh, the management's so dedicated. I really think that they could turn this one around. Now, the next stock in my portfolio is Alibaba, a company most value investors are familiar with. This one has been a struggle, which I've looked at the fundamentals of this company to break down Alibaba. This is a company that I'm in the red by 3,700 right now. It's actually came back a lot. I was in the red by 5,500. So I'm actually moving more towards the green on this one. But Alibaba was a company that every single metric about it looks like it's undervalued. Alibaba is in cloud hosting, fintech, online retail. It's one of the most powerful companies in China. And the company's just been devastated. The reason why is because of the Chinese government and distrust from the US to China. That's the reason why, completely macro. As a fundamental investor, looking at the fundamentals, the company remains very solid. Undervalued, good fundamentals, moving in the right direction. Macro is the problem with this company. So what I plan on doing is holding onto it for the next five years and seeing if some of the macro sentiment changes. If anything moves to the positive between the US and China over the next five years, then Alibaba likely will, it'll be treated better by investors. Right now, the sentiment is extremely poor between the US and China. Companies are pulling out of China. Relationships aren't good. So this company is struggling, but I think that could turn around. Fundamentally speaking, again, everything looks solid in my opinion. After Alibaba, we have two companies that I group into the same basket, Salesforce and Adobe. Both of them are at somewhat elevated valuations because they're high growth companies. Both of them are premium companies that I think have products that are incredibly powerful, that have huge total addressable markets, um, and they have different moats. I think both of them have a very wide moat. Let's go ahead and look at Salesforce. Ticker symbol CRM. This company is a relatively big company, $167 billion market cap. It has a 35 PE ratio, so it's trading at a premium. Here are the reasons why. The revenue growth is incredible. You don't see many companies with this type of revenue growth. The EBITDA growth is also very, very fast, right? It's growing at a pretty rapid speed. But the highlight of this company is the most important metric, the free cash flow. Look at this free cash flow growth. Now, Salesforce has been doing dilution. This causes a lot of concern for investors because the more shares outstanding, the more you have to share your free cash flow with other people and their new shares. So this dilutes you as a shareholder. But even when we adjust for the dilution and we look at the free cash flow on a per share basis, it's still very rapid. This is faster growth than most companies in terms of free cash flow per share than most other companies that aren't even diluting. So even dilution adjusted, Salesforce is growing their free cash flow at a very rapid speed. From 2015, it went from $1.21 to now $5.51 or 53 cents. That's very quick. So as long as they're doing this, as long as they're growing their free cash flow on a per share basis this rapid, I don't really care if they do a little dilution. That doesn't bother me as long as my shares that I own and I purchase are worth more in total cash flow than the year prior. As long as that happens, I don't really care if they're diluting or they're doing buybacks. And what I see right here is free cash flow per share growing very rapidly. Outside of that, Salesforce, I think, is one of the best growth stories in the market. It has a wide moat. The company is the operating system for businesses. They can't easily switch from Salesforce to another, another competing service. So once you sign up for Salesforce, be careful. 
you're probably going to keep it for years and years into the future. I really do think this company is going to do really well over the next five years. And it's gone through a massive sale. The company's really traded down in price with a lot of the other tech companies. But this one has a lot better fundamentals than most SaaS companies out there. Adobe's the next one. I have $5,000 invested in this company. I'm currently down $468. I've avoided the biggest fall with Adobe by not investing in this company until it really came down in price. So Adobe used to trade at 673. I wasn't buying it at this point. I started buying the company right in the low 400s and right now it trades at 382. So I'm down a little bit but I avoided most of the sell off with this company. Adobe's pretty incredible. It has a Petrosky score of seven, which means fundamentally, most of the fundamentals are moving in the right direction. The revenue growth is wild with Adobe. Look at this revenue growth. It looks almost made up. I promise you, these are the real numbers. From 2014, the revenue went from 4.15 billion to 15.7 in 2017. And this is like an older company. It's been around since 1986 is when we got the first data point here, but they're just accelerating in revenue growth. That's incredible to see a company this old multiply its revenue this much. And that's because of a business model change. They went from a one-time sale company to a SaaS model with Adobe Creative Cloud. And that just really, that really took off the business. It really took off like a rocket. So we look at this, the EBITDA falls the same. It's a high margin business. The free cash flow per share is wild. Look at this chart. This is not something you see with virtually any other company. In 2015, the free cash flow per share was $2.58. Then in 2021, it was $14.43. That is massive growth. This company's really doing something right. The leadership of this company really over the past five years has done an incredible job. So if they continue to execute the way that they have, whatever they're doing is working really well. Adobe does have, I think, a huge monopoly of creative products. They get their products and services in people's hands. They even just came out with a freemium version of Photoshop to get more people using it. So I think they're going in the right direction. And again, on top of the free cash flow per share, they have growing revenues, EBITDA, net income, earnings per share, a very strong balance sheet. Their shares outstanding are going down over time. They're not diluting you. It's just a great company. Across the board, Adobe has proven to be for a very long time, an incredibly high company. And that's why investors are willing to pay a little bit of a premium, a 27 PE ratio for it, when most companies in the market are trading below a 20. So Adobe is more expensive than other companies. If you wanna know why, take a look at their free cash flow per share chart. That is the reason why. The next company up is one that nobody's a stranger to, Apple. Obviously, one of my favorite companies ever. I'm an Apple fanboy is what people call me. and. I'll admit to that. I love Apple products. I have a ton of them. I love the angle that Apple's doing, becoming the healthcare company with the Apple Watch, becoming the privacy focused company, making products that people love to use. This is a company that I like the fundamentals of, but I also love the company qualitatively. And I know the reason that Warren Buffett purchased this company. He purchased it because he considers it a consumer staple, like Kraft Heinz. In fact, it's a consumer staple with higher margins. That's really what Apple is. The company has an eight Petrosky score, very high, which means that basically all the fundamentals are moving in the right direction. The revenue, EBITDA, free cash flow, net income. Their balance sheet is ridiculous. They're doing buy now, pay later, but they're acting like the bank themselves, which they're now a fintech company, but they have major advantages over fintech companies. So Apple's a healthcare company. Apple's a consumer defensive company because they have the iPhone with an ecosystem around it. Apple's a fintech company, better than most fintechs, because unlike most fintechs, Apple doesn't have to partner with a bank. They have the balance sheet to be their own bank. They have $100 billion in cash, and they generate billions of dollars in cash every single quarter. The more you learn about Apple as an investment, the more you realize it makes sense that Warren Buffett has this as 40% of his portfolio, and he continued to buy the company at 150. This company is unlike most other companies in the market. It is incredible. And that's the reason that Apple is the biggest holding in my dividend portfolio by far. I've invested heavily in this company. I have it in the story fund as well. I just think it's an incredible company at a very reasonable valuation. A 21.9 PE ratio, in my opinion, is way low. This company should be at a high 20, low 30s PE. So I think it's wildly undervalued. When I look at the cash flow of the company, obviously it's just absurd. Apple generates more cash flow than any company in the world by far. 
Last year, in 2021, they generated $92.9 billion in free cash flow. If we break that down on a per share basis, the growth is even faster because they're reducing the amount of shares outstanding rapidly. Their free cash flow per share last year was $5.57. And just a couple years before that, it was $2.43. So they've effectively doubled the amount of cash flow per share just since 2017. That's very fast. They're growing their cash flow that the investors have, that you and I get to keep, very fast. And that's, of course, something that Warren Buffett likes to see and any shareholder of Apple. They're doing that by reinvesting back in the company and earning more money, raising their margins, buying back their shares, paying a dividend on top of that. It's really an incredible company. I think Apple will outperform over the next five years. In my opinion, this company has a moat that is way bigger than most companies in the market. I would say it's one of the biggest moats in the market. Morningstar rates Apple's moat as narrow, which I literally think is laughable. I do not think that Apple has a narrow moat. So that's my take on it. I don't want you to go buy Apple because I said so. This is just my opinion. I'm telling you what I'm doing with my money. I think Apple is an incredibly good buy right now. Now let's go ahead and look at the last one, Meta. Meta is a company that not as many people love it right off the bat because it's Mark Zuckerberg who is kind of unrelatable. Most people don't like Facebook, but value investors are attracted to this company for good reason. It trades at a ridiculously low valuation, a 13.3 PE ratio, 13.3. So the valuation, big thumbs up. This company trades at a good valuation. The growth of it also doesn't look too bad. We keep hearing about how the growth of Meta is slowing down, and that's kind of true. Over the last six quarters, it slowed down a bit. But again, we look at this on a year-over-year -year basis. It just doesn't look too bad. The company is growing faster than most companies. And in my opinion, it's a joke it trades at a 13 PE ratio. If we look at Meta's EBITDA, this is also a high margin company. So not only are they growing their top line revenue, they're growing their EBITDA. This is a proxy for their earnings at a very fast pace as well. And then the most important metric, the free cash flow of the company, if we break this down on a per share basis, this is what it looks like. This is very impressive free cash flow growth. And the nice thing about Meta, the nice thing about this company is it has massive valuation support. There are some companies that grow their free cash flow, but the valuation is a little bit more iffy. Companies like Adobe, right? It's growing its free cash flow, but the valuation is a little bit stretched. Meta is growing its free cash flow, but the valuation is incredibly good. Look at this, for example. Last year in 2021, the free cash flow per share was $13.90. So you're getting $14 per share per year in free cash flow from Meta, and their shares are $170. Bucks. So you're paying around 13 times the free cash flow on a per share basis, a 13 times multiple. That is inexpensive. That is very cheap. Now, in terms of qualitative analysis, I don't love everything that Meta is doing. I don't think that they should have named the company Meta based off the metaverse, something that's unproven. Maybe Meta will work out for them. But what if metaverse becomes somewhat of a flop or something that really doesn't take a hold? You know, they really named their company after something that doesn't really even exist in any real way right now. So I don't like that. I don't like that Mark Zuckerberg has kind of forgotten about the other aspects of the company and he's diving into the metaverse more than anything else. But regardless, it doesn't really matter. Even with the spend on the metaverse, even with his involvement in it, the company is just too undervalued. In my opinion, the valuation leaves a large margin of safety. So that's my thoughts on Meta. So overall, looking at every company, the big takeaway here is in terms of what I'm looking at and what I'm focusing on with my portfolio is doing fundamental valuation on companies and trying to assess which ones I can buy the most future free cash flows for the cheapest price. That's really what I'm trying to do. This portfolio is just a representation of this. Not every one of these companies will be winners. There's gonna be some winners and losers. I don't know which ones right now. We'll see in the next five years. But I think in aggregate, there's gonna be some significant winners in this portfolio that will hopefully make up for the losers. That's the goal. So we'll see how this turns out together. I think it'll be fun to find out. You can follow along with the progress. I'll continue to give transparent updates every single week. Whether it's good or bad, I'll show it either way. And you can follow along for free by subscribing to the channel.